This is the Average Guy Network, and you have found Home Gadget Geek show number 543, recorded on August 25th, 2022. Here at Home Gadget Geeks, we cover all the favorite tech gadgets that find their way in your home. News reviews, product updates, and conversation, all for the average tech guy. I'm your host, Jim Carlson, broadcasting live from the AverageGuy.tv studios here in a beautiful Bellevue, Nebraska. And of course, the weather's been beautiful, and nobody knows that better than Mike Weger. Mike is back, at least for this show. Mike, welcome back. It's so good to be back. It feels like a normal Thursday again. Yeah, the weather's been fantastic. Got a nice little rainstorm last night, but the, the lawn needed it. Yeah. Um, yeah, you know, recently actually installed a smart water system, mm-hmm. uh, watering system, and it's been nice because I can check it and it's like, hey, by the way, we delayed for the day, and I can always tell, oh, rain must nice. be on the way. So nice. You little alerts what, there. What'd you put in? What kind of what kind of system did you? I knew you were going to yeah. ask me that right now, and <laughs> and I, so I am is it like a rain bird or was it? What, what, was um, it? it is. Give me two seconds here. Yeah, yeah. Um, no uh, people people are going to want to know, you know. So, I'll give you a second. Oh man, this is bad. <laughs> no, anyways, I had uh, I had like on the t- oh so so it's the orbit system. Oh, right? okay. so I went with yeah. the orbit system. It's the orbit beehive. So the beehive system, and this is one that you can actually get from Lowe's. It's super inexpensive for like 60 bucks. Mm. And I did have to, it's only an eight zone and I have nine. So I just put two zones on the one sensor. So it runs both those zones at the same time. I put two of my uh, smaller, smaller zones yeah. that so that it doesn't overload the water system. Uh, but man, that thing took 10 minutes to put in. Uh, maybe another 15 just to walk around and name the zones. I said, you figured out, you do all the auto stuff. I didn't do anything. Oh. And it is fantastic. It is just, it was one of the best like life upgrades I did over the summer. Um, and just, lo- I love every day logging into the schedule because it projects out the next two weeks, but it's live changing. So obviously the forecast is going to change, but it's going to tell you how much, when, what days it's thinking it's going to water, how much in inches it's the, the rainfall did, how much it's putting on the lawn, dehydration like all of that and it for 60 bucks i was shocked yeah um and i i watched a ton of reviews on these systems um and then this one was was by far um one of the best i was going to do a self-hosted one i was going to run one on a raspberry pi there's some open source software out there but everyone said if you just want it to work and be smart um go with go with the orbit beehive system so uh not to kick off i didn't even intend for that to be into the show but as you brought up the weather i was like oh yeah that was that was the best part of this morning is my sprinklers didn't run and you know to be seen what i love about it is it tells you how much water you are using and it keeps historical data so i will be able to see how much water i'm using um yeah I don't know if it's going to save me a ton, to be honest, because it's, it's actually doing a better job of putting more water on than I thought. I think I was underwatering my lawn. My lawn was pretty dead. Mm. Um, I wasn't doing a good job of updating it. But I think overall, in the long term, not having it done, going on rain times and stuff like that, I think will eventually even out and probably save me and just end up with a, a better looking lawn, you know, overall. Do you have, does it, how does it know, like, it? do you have um, moisture sensors in the, in the lawn that it it's or whatever you it's so that so it knows is that how it works no so it's kind of interesting the way it works so number one it's pulling the weather data from yep. you can tell it where you want it to pull from right so i'm pulling from it's actually a weather station that's a decent a ways away you can pull from any weather station though so if you had your own weather station you could pull from that uh there's that whole system that people can connect their weather stations too. So that's number one, how it's knowing how much rainfall there is, is it's using whatever closest weather station you tell it to. Um, but the setup process is really interesting. So when you first set it up, it walks you through on the app. You It says, okay, I'm turning on zone one, go find it. You say, okay. And you can even take a picture as, as the icon for that zone. So you know, which is great because uh, how often do you forget where's yeah. zone two again when that's running? Um, so no, that's the great. And then it, it asks you a bunch of questions for each zone. So it says, hey, is this getting, is this area a lot of shade or no shade? You say, okay, no shade, uh, right? Cause it's going to run different zones at different times to know. Cause each yeah. zone needs a little bit of different water. Right. Then it tells, it asks how many sprinkler heads and the type is this the pivoting ones? Is it the one that just spurts out? Cause those have different flow rates. Right. Um, and then it says, is it on a slope or not? Cause is the water going to stay there or is it going to run off? Yeah. And my lawn has a 
variation of all of these things, which yeah. is kind of nice. I think most yeah. most lawns do, right? You have shady spots, you have hilly spots. Um, the one aspect that I did not do because I didn't have them with me, but my friend at work actually got the cups. They have these little cups you can get. And they're just measuring cups and it can walk you through, Hey, put the cup in the lawn and it'll run it for a while. And then how much water is in there? That way it really has an accurate amount of how much water is coming from these sprinkler heads. That's the next step. You don't need to do that, but it's, it's an option. So I didn't do that part yet, but even, and then it asks you the soil type, right? So what kind of, is it sandy soil? Is it, you know, and there's all the different types and you can read to figure out which soil types you have. Um, and, and from all of that data, so then you have, so I have nine different zones um, I had to combine two of them, but it, it knows then generally how much water to put on each. So it's very interesting to go look at the historical time of, Hey, it ran zones one, five, seven, and eight this morning. It didn't run the other two because the water was retained from yesterday's watering. Um, and then mm. it rained today, so it's not going to do anything. That's enough water actually for the next two days. It, it's, it's fascinating for me. I'm such a nerd on that sort of data, yeah. Yeah. um, that I love just logging in. And I was, I was just shocked, Jim, at how easy these things are to remove. Um, you could put it on in 10 minutes, you could have it removed with your old system back on in 10 minutes. It is so wow. simple um, to, to replace those if you already have a sprinkler system mm -hmm. in there. So I had an old manual Rainbird system, just plucked it out, plopped this one in and away we went. It was, it was extremely easy. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's, that's, I, you know, I don't have an irrigation system built in, so I would need to do that. But this, I, I've actually, you know, I've been walking every morning at six o'clock. So I'm, I'm the automated sprinkler system. So I'm like, well, what needs water and where are we putting it? And for how long it always run for an hour, you know, kind of deal. But, um, it, it that's kind of worked for me. The other thing, super low tech, but down here, right before you leave to go out into the garage is the air conditioner and the, uh, the, you know, the water, the, the, the water that comes out of, of the, uh, the coils, right. You know, you, you'd put it into a con it's condensation goes into a condensate pump and then we run it out and up and into the drain and it runs out. Like I've done that for a hundred years. And this year I was like, you know, I wonder how much water that condensation makes. It's in a sense, free water. Right. I yeah. mean, think about, right. Just pumping it out of here. But the, the real interesting thing was like, how much am I, how much water do I make in a day? So I got a five gallon bucket, a you know, just, yeah, just a five gallon bucket, put it on, took it out of the condensate pump, put it in the bucket and just let it run for a day. I came back. It was full. <laughs> it was like, oh crap. Like, so four to five gallons a day on a, a lot on of a, water when it's really hot. Right. And yeah. So I've just been taking that out and dumping it. You know, I, I built some new, you know, last, uh, last fall I built, remember I built some new retaining wall structures mm -hmm. here. Well, those get full sun and they just bake. Whatever is in there just absolutely bakes because it gets that full afternoon sun. So take that bucket of water and you know spread it along, guilt free. This is free water that came out of the house, right? As part of the cooling process. So that's been. Um, I toyed with the idea of of having that condensate pump push it up and out to a container outside that then it would have a. I just put a drip you know, I'd put a low pressure drip system in. So I'd be constantly filling that up and then it would just drain as it got, it, it would just drain it out. I still might do that, but I was like, well, I want, I wanted to know how much water, like in your case, now you've got this on there. You're kind of like, Oh, now I know how much water. Cause it really, it keeps track, right? For yep, it does. And in this case, I'm like, Holy cow. I had no idea I was going through five gallons of water a day just in, in condensation from the air conditioner. So yeah. Wow. Interesting. Well, so uh, super cool. Um, um, and so, and the, uh, unplanned, actually this whole show is unplanned just to really be honest with it, but we'll have a lot of content in it. Speaking of a lot of content, big thanks to, uh, to Aaron Lawrence who joined us last week. She's always, she says, hi, Mike. She was, she's a rock star. She, yeah. She's, she's pretty great. And she'll be back again next quarter. But, um, uh, Big thanks to Aaron who joined us again here and and uh, had a lot of content and a lot of great things to say. Covered some TVs. Oh, just a point, and producer Bob brought this up. Those thermocells that we talked about, Mike, are you familiar? You know the thermocell? Is that um, for mosquitoes? For the mosquitoes. Those ones? Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, Bob sent me a note over the week talking about those. The active ingredient in those pads, you know, basically you just, the, 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 uh, the, you, you put a tube of uh, propane in there, or not propane, 
butane basically. And that just puts up a little, it creates a little hot spot in there that warms up those pads and then it releases those active ingredients. Those active ingredients in that are super deadly to fish and not great for your pets. Hmm. So make sure there's plenty of warning labels on this, but just since we talked about it last week, just make sure you're reading the warning labels and you're using, if you're, if you bought one of those things, I know Ed bought one. Um, if you're, if you bought one of those things, use them appropriately. Just, just know what you're doing um, with that. They're probably not great to hold like right here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> put them, put them, you know, six, six, seven, eight feet away. If it's windy, don't, don't put them in the direction where the wind's blowing directly on you. Probably not even great to use in windy situations because they, the whole idea is that they kind of envelop you in this and, and slow the bugs down. So just Bob, thanks for that note. He pinged me on discord. If you want to join us in the discord group, send me an email or don't no, send me an email. Uh, join us over there. Um, the average guy TV slash discord. And uh, we'd love to have you um, in the group as well. Mike's still over there, still hanging out over there. So if you miss Mike, you can catch him in Discord. Mike, uh, what have you been? Just give us a quick two minutes. What have you been up to over the last couple months? You know, it's been a lot of kid stuff. It was actually, it was perfect timing, Jim, for me to take a break. Um, the weeks of, you know, soccer and kids events. And we did a lot of traveling. Uh, we got out. I was traveling for work too. So it was, it was a lot of getting out and about with the kids all summer. And so we really took advantage. This was, so my oldest just went into kindergarten this year. Um, and it's the first year that both of those, both of my boys aren't in the same school because my younger is still in the Montessori school. Uh, so we just took advantage of just having a really fun summer and, you know, with soccer practice, soccer games and during the summer and then um, hockey, still playing hockey. And uh, the baseball is starting this fall. So it's our first round of T-ball, which is starting pretty soon here. Um, it was just it was just a really good family based summer. We went down to the Ozarks for a, a whole week. Um, so got some, got some lake time in there and, um, you know, work wise, it, it's so interesting in the summer cause we are back full time. Um, so, and we've been back ever since last May. Uh, so work has been insanely busy as we prep for, we do a national conference coming up here in about three weeks. And so doing all the prep for that and, and that side of my life never slowed down either. But yeah, so the first day of kindergarten went really well good. and it was happy, went right in and uh, that was good for mom and dad. There was, there was no tears shed, which I was, I was ready for the worst. I was prepared. Yeah. The, <laughs> and it only happens once yeah. per child, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right? once per child, but you, you get one crack at it. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm glad I, we, of course we're friends on Facebook. So I, I watched, uh, you know, I stalk your family. Yeah, I, I just I try it. to be, I just try to be a, a, you know, I try to be a grandparent on the, you know, but never see the kids. So it's um, a great opportunity to watch and you're doing a great job with them. So congrats on that. Getting one in kindergarten is a big deal. The second one will be there before you know it. And then, oh, and then there's no more cost for daycare, which I'm so excited for. <laughs> well, but then you're paying for college. Well, that's true. That's true. <laughs> well, so, you know what? With the way things yeah. are going right now, I'm not sure we'll, if we'll be paying for college. We'll see how that whole changes. We got, oh you know, 13 years until my oldest. And yeah, who yeah. knows what it's going to look like then? You, you know, totally. It's it's a different world today than it yeah. was then. We are, uh, fortunately, we're super close. I, I think to having just about everybody um, paid <laughs> at this point. We've got some stuff to do, um, some some debts to cover, but uh, it's always a challenge, but uh, yeah. it'll be here. It'll be oh, here. Yesterday's uh, news probably helped a little bit. So that's good. A little bit. Yeah, yeah. a little bit. It's And so, um, you know, we'll, we'll see what happens. I, listen, I, I learned a long time ago. Don't count your chickens, chickens before they hatch. Yeah, so, for sure. Like, we'll see come January 1. <laughs> just kind of see how things go and, and all that other good stuff. Mike, um, you've been doing some, uh, some well, I, I wanted to say crypto, but it's really more blockchain yeah. So get, right. Give us some, get, fill us in on what you've been working on. Yeah. So um, I I needed to dive back into the crypto world. And the reason I needed to dive back in is because, man, I rode that Shibu Inu coin train all the way up and all the way back oh, down. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. I had ridden it all the way back down. Mine, mine crashed and exploded at the bottom. I rode it oh, down so far. It, yeah. Me too. Fiery yeah. mess. Like, <laughs> Just, um, yeah, dogs and cats living together. Total chaos. Yeah. yeah. Like, financially, easily one of the worst decisions I ever made, riding that down. Like, yeah. easily. Because yeah. um, yeah. it, it doubled. If you remember, it doubled a week oh, after I, I bought it. Well, oh, actually, within two days. Yeah. And I just rode the train all the way back down. Anyway. Yeah. If so, I, listen, hold on before. I, if, I, I, if I had stopped with the first purchase and just sold it, like, I, I made it would have made a killing on that. Same. But I, got, I got greedy. Same. And then I was like, oh, I could buy some more. And I remember my son, my number two son was here. And I said that. And he looked at me like, you shouldn't have bought it anymore. 
that was the look that I got from him. And I thought, well, what does he know? And then literally that night it started plummeting. And then you get kind of, oh, well, maybe it'll come back or I yep. should buy more because it's going down. You have all these stupid thoughts, you know? So yeah, I was, I was there. Now, fortunately it wasn't a lot of money, but yeah, you know, you just, you're like, God, dumb, stupid, dumb, stupid. Yeah. So anyways. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And, and I had gone in pretty hard on it. So it was, it was a painful, it was a learning experience, right? I got greedy on it. Um, it's, it's all, it's all still fun money, right? I always, we've always talked about that, you know, never put your mortgage payment uh, into crypto. So it wasn't anything detrimental, but still or, it hurt. Or your, or your kids, what you're going to use to pay off your kids. Yeah. That yeah, too. that too. <laughs> so, uh, so, you know, it came time, this was probably in, in June that I needed to get back into crypto because that had really jaded me, Jim. Like I had ridden this thing all the way down. I was just like, and all of a sudden I realized that I was in crypto for the big rides and big thrills. And that's not what I like about crypto, right? So I had gotten so mad about this thing going down and down and down, never coming up. I was checking prices for the price's sake. Um, and I had kind of gotten away from the fun side of crypto and blockchain. So I said, okay, I'm going to change this up. I'm going to change it up. I am going to, first of all, put all of that that was in Sheeb. I'm switching that over to Ethereum. And I actually timed it, luckily, perfectly. Um, I hit the bottom on Ethereum. I got it in 900. Um, Ooh, so it's nice. has since doubled, yeah. which has been nice. Yeah. That That's helped yeah. the pain a little bit. Yeah. Um, so that came up. But what I did was I, I took a bunch of the extra money that I hadn't had in Sheeb, um, some mining money and some things like that. And I wanted to get back into some crypto projects or some blockchain projects. And so I, I started looking around for, you know, what's what's the latest project? Because you and I in the past have done, we've done Shia, and we've done a lot of storage-based projects. Um, and you and I have also done, which is not crypto related, we've done like the folding at home, right? We actually did that as part of this crew, like the whole home community. gadgets community, right? We ran, especially during, you know, COVID, we were having competitions on doing folding at home. And for those of you who don't know, that's essentially just donating your unused computing resources around your house for research projects. So I was familiar with that concept. And what I ended up finding were two different projects that were pretty intriguing to me. And uh, I really hope my air conditioning turns off at some point. I can I can hear it in my own headset. But <laughs> but um, so I found two products that I was really interested in. the The first one I'll talk about is PreSearch, and PreSearch is think of it as a decentralized search engine um, that is competing with the likes of Google, and they are focused a lot on privacy in the sense that you know no one big organization is collecting a bunch of data on you when you're doing searches. Um, so there's a few different aspects of, of pre-search. Pre-search, number one, if you guys just want to use pre-search, I highly recommend it. I have now made the switch. Pre-search is my default search engine. And this is this is outside the realm of me running a node. It was just because I, I wanted to, if I'm going to run a node, I'm going to actually use it and see how it works. Um, so pre-search is my default. You can get a get the Chrome plugin if you're running Chrome. And that just is an easy way to make it. So when you do the search bar, you know, like when you type in your URL bar on Chrome, I usually that would do a Google search. Now that does a pre-search. You do earn actually a little bit of pre-search for every search. Now, the way they have it set up now, you have to get a thousand before you can ever cash that out. I've been doing it for a few months. And I'm up to like 41 um, from that, right? So it's that don't use it for that reason. Use it because it is truly not giving, you know, a company like Google your your search data, which is kind of cool. Um, you can also, I do highly recommend getting the app for iOS. Um, iOS, if you're running an iPhone, is a little bit harder to set a default search engine, but I just use that app and I set that as my default browser. And so now anytime I open stuff or search things, I'm using the pre-search app instead of Safari. Um, I was expecting, you know, if, uh, if some trials and tribulations with this, but really the only downside I have found to pre-search is I do realize that I am very used to typing like Lowe's or Home Depot into the search bar. And it, and you know, Google has the Google maps thing on the right side where it shows the location. And I didn't realize how much I use that. Right. And then Jim's showing this on the screen now, this is pre-search. So he just searched himself. There's no like extra stuff as of now. So um, what you can do on the left side, what Jim's showing is you can directly take your search over to a different search engine like YouTube, or if you want to go back to Google or Twitter. So it'll take what you just searched. And if you do want to go back and search yourself, so, so Jim just clicked on Google, it took his same search and it plugged him into Google. So kind of nice that you can connect directly over to another search engine. Um, they, I just, I, I've, I've liked it so far. It's been a pretty good engine. Um, I've found discovery and what it pulls up is pretty nice. It's not as um, creepy. I'll say, you know, like Google, when you search stuff, you're like, oh man, like that result is very tailored to me, which 
you know, there's a point to that being kind of nice and a, a tailored ad. I'd rather prefer, honestly, a tailored ad than a non-tailored ad uh, might be a little bit beneficial to me. Um, but, but, but give it a try, right? So that's the search aspect of pre-search. Now on the back end, how they're running this is people are self-hosting pre-search nodes. So essentially when someone runs a search, like when Jim just searched himself on pre-search, that went to someone's self-hosted pre-search node and it ran the search through that node. So think of like a little tiny virtual machine that is that you are hosting and you now are running the network for pre-search. So this pre-search actually kind of took off this year and it's become really popular for running nodes. And I will say for both of these projects, I think the majority of people are running their self-hosted nodes in a VPS. So they're using, you know, some sort of cloud provider and just turning on a little tiny virtual machine and doing it that way. And there are a ton of tutorials out there. I'm not going to get in the nitty gritty for using a VPS, um, but a ton of people are using VPSs. And I think the reason they're doing that is because um, a lot of people are actually treating this as an investment um, because the way both of these programs work, and I, I really like the way they work is if you want to set up a node, you set up the node, but you need to put up collateral to actually get rewards and get paid for running a node. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is you need to stake a certain amount of the pre-search coins into your node for the node to be running and to be getting um, actual uh, payment for what you're doing. So you do get paid a little bit. So for each of these, it's a little bit different. Um, so pre-search and, and they're both rather expensive actually. But the great part about both these projects is the collateral at any time. You're like, eh, I want to try off my pre-search node. You just get that collateral back. It's not set for a certain period of time. You're not burning that collateral. You're not saying I'm going to commit this for 12 months or six months. You just have to have it in the account for it to be running. And if at any point in time you want to turn it off, you just get whatever you stake back out. So it's there's no risk to it, I guess, besides the fact that um, the value of those coins is changing and it can go up and down, but that's just like any other crypto. So what I'll show you guys, and I, I can share my screen here real quick. There's, I'm checking real quick to make sure there's nothing. Uh, I think we're good here. Okay, where is that? There we go. Okay. So here's my dashboard. So you guys will see that I have 4,000 pre-search staked. So that is how much you need to stake for one node. And right now it's about nine cents for per uh, per coin, right? And that's gone up and down. Um, it's gone been up, I think as high as like uh, 25, 50 cents, maybe even. It's, it's down at 10 right now. It, it followed all the coins, followed that same trajectory over the last year. So you're talking about $400 worth of crypto, roughly, that you're going to need to stake. And so what I've done, is you'll see these are all of my nodes, but there's there's kind of a, a funny part about it. So I only have one stake. So only one of these nodes is actually making me any pre-coin. And the way this is working is um, I actually am running this node on the Flux network. So I probably should have started with my next project first. So we might come back to this after I tell you about Flux. So Flux um, is the other project that I got into. So essentially I am not, I was self-hosting my own pre-node on a virtual machine on Unraid. Um, and so essentially what that was is just a tiny virtual machine running on your NAS, think of it. So that's my Unraid and the node lives and breathes there. The great part about both these projects is you don't even notice they're running. They are so small. So if you think of, if you're trying to replace your mining, like if mining, like, oh man, the electrical cost and keeping up with it and what you're getting paid. Now you're not getting paid as much, but you're not going to increase your electrical bill by doing either of these projects. Cause it's just using a, I mean, a tiny, your, my CPU meter is not even moving, especially for pre-search. It's not that bad. So at first I was running my own virtual machine and, and running it. And then I found out that you can actually run your node on Flux. So I'll get into Flux in a second. So that is what you're seeing here. And the reason there's a few is because Flux is a distributed computing network. So when you run your node on Flux, Flux actually creates a few different nodes and distributes them out a little bit, and they all show up in your dashboard. I think they're going to work on that and clean it up so that really it only creates one true um, node. But you just, so it, it populates it with four nodes. You pick one, you stake it with 4,000, and you can see, you know, this one's only been running since uh, the 16th. And it's done, it's gotten 316 requests for searches. It's answered 310 of them. And I have made 39 pre-search uh, coin since the 16th. So if you think about about nine days ago. $3. Uh, yeah, $3. Yeah. 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 So, but nine days, $3 and literally no extra electrical cost. Um, not bad. 
not bad for what you're doing there. No. Does that, can you scale that out at all? Could you have different, it, it, it just depends on, do you want to, and this is, I mean, listen, all the cryptocurrencies have moved to this site. Not all of them. Many of them moved to this idea of stake, right? They, yeah. the early ones, people got in and sold and that wasn't good for the coin. And so they would, then they started saying, okay, if you stake, you'll start, you can, you'll make more if you, the more you stake just to kind of, just to kind of keep the, you know, to keep the ecosystem alive. They know they needed to have some skin in the game yeah. to do that. So it sounds here like they're doing that to keep, to keep it from being just a generate and sell um, kind of opportunity. Yeah, I think, I think that is exact. That's one of the main reasons. I think the other main reason too, that both of these projects I'm going to talk about have staking mechanisms and that is you want these to be reliable. You don't want people spinning up and turning down all the time and turning them on, turning them off because that uh, eliminates the whole purpose, right? The search engine will not run if the nodes are not reliable. Same thing with Flux, which we'll talk about. So you need reliable nodes. So, you know, if you have to put up, even if you just have to get $400 in crypto and put it and park it here for a little bit, like that's enough of a commitment that I'm not just going to be turning this thing on and off as I please, right? And I'm very worried about, you know, I want to make sure the internet, you know, stays up and it stays running and it's reliable. But to back to my point on the VPS side and scaling this up, I think for a lot of people, you can only run one of these per public IP. So if you're running this at home, you can only run one node. And a lot of people, I mean, are running 20 or 30 nodes. Like this is a big investment for them because it does not really increase your rewards if you stake more per node. You could stake 5,000, 6,000 per node, but people have found out that it's actually more beneficial to just do a bunch of 4,000 staked nodes. So they'll run 20 or 30 of these. And so I think that's why people have gone the VPS route, which is just firing up a bunch of VMs. It just increases your cost, right? And to run that on a VPS, I mean, you're probably gonna pay three to five bucks a month, I'm assuming, to run that little virtual machine. Um, in the cloud. And so you got to take that out of your profitability. So the, the way I was looking at both of these was, well, I can run it at home for free. So might as well spin them up. And and that's kind of why I started playing around with the project, which is pretty cool. Justin, uh, Justin in chat says, uh, use one node over time to stake the next. That could be a yeah. strategy. Might take a while to get there, he says, but it could be it, automated. So it just keeps scaling itself. Yeah, it, it would. If you think about it, you know, so this one, 39 you need 4000 per node to stake that's the minimum so it would take a while cuz this one has been up for about 9 days so i mean that's it's going to take a long time um but if you staked a few right if you put in you know a couple thousand um then those could generate enough to roll into the next one or roll into the next one. i think you'd have to start with a base of maybe 5 5 to 7 um to make that model work and it's not four, it's 4000 of the coin whatever that whatever yes 4000 oh. of the coin if you were going to do this and the price is down, it's better to get in now. Yeah. And it's down than if the, if, if it, if it begins to go up from a coin perspective, what's their end game on the, on the actual cryptocurrency side of things? Are they, do they have a plan for that? What are they thinking along those lines? Do you know? You know, they've been, everything I read about them, they're just so focused on the search aspect and creating a really good search project. That's what I liked about these two is they, they they barely talk about their crypto price. And there's not, you know, like there's those communities where you get in and everyone's just talking about to the moon and, and like all those, and everyone just wants the price to skyrocket. Lambo. Yeah, both yeah. these projects, the people are bought in because of the cool use case for it. Um, and I think they're the average user base for pre-search just keeps going up and up and up and people are really like using it. And it's a fantastic product. Like the fact that I was able to replace Google with pre-search and not find too many ways where I'm like, oh, this kind of sucks uh, is is nice. I've been pleasantly surprised with how well it runs. Yeah. Oh, um, and so the other thing oh, I'll mention real oh, quick, yeah, um, if you want to pop back to my screen, the other interesting part about this is how they're doing advertising. So if you think about it, they um, have to have a way to some way monetize and get ads running just like Google. So they have been testing out, and I forgot I, I took away mine. I, I had an example put in here um, earlier. They are doing keyword staking. So essentially what you do, and the way they're doing their advertising right now, this is kind of stage one. They're testing out a few different ways of how they want advertising to work on their platform. Um, but you can search a keyword. So for a while there, I had book. So like, let's look up book. And it's like you want to you want to stake book. And what that mean what I mean by that is whenever anyone searches book, your ad is going to show up on top, and you can the ad can be whatever you want. Um, so book right now, max stake was five forty five. I actually had this for a hundred pre 
for like weeks. It was awesome. So, and that puts you in the number one spot and you're getting a ton of hits. I got like 20,000 hits on my book keyword. So if you guys want to start, if you guys like state, if you're into Google keywords and search and all that stuff and advertisements, go do it on pre-search. Cause right now it's kind of this untapped potential and people are actually making a lot of money doing this. And let me show you. So if you want to run book, so right now the top ad, let's just see what someone's running on the book. Okay. So someone is advertising the dark social. Um, they're advertising a specific book. I'm assuming it's their book or they're making some money on it. So that's what they have made the link for when people search book, that is what's going to show up. Um, it, well, it's going to, there's going to be an advertisement and there's wording that you can put with it. So for me to get the number one spot, I would have to stake more than 545 tokens. So I could say, well, maybe I'm willing to stake 600 there. And a lot of people are, right? Cause it's just a stake. You get it right back. You're not spending it. It's not ad spend, which is the crazy part about all of this, um, is that in the future, it's going to be ad spend, right? It's going to cost coins. But right now, if I wanted to, I could use, you know, 600 coins, stake it for a few weeks and then pull it right back. And I didn't spend anything to have that advertisement out there, which is kind of interesting. Um, so I had book for a while and what I did was I went over to Amazon Associates and you know how you can, you know, you can get revenue from an Amazon, Amazon Associates account. And I ran, I pulled an Audible ad. So I pulled an Audible um, URL and it was for like three free months. And so I made my advertisement like three free months of Audible, whatever, whatever. And so when people were searching book, it was all of a sudden up top was an ad for Audible and it was then I was getting some credit on the Amazon Associates side for what when they would click and they would buy it, which is kind of fascinating. So I had a few of these. I also had sunglasses because I love Shady Ray sunglasses. I'm part of their affiliates program. Um, and so the advertising aspect of this is also kind of a, a unique way when you're doing it with staking instead of actually spending money right now. So yeah, so something cool to look at. Um, so sunglasses. I wonder what well, put in, put in sun, do the next one do podcast. I want to see what that. Okay. The tech terms, yeah, 20,000. The tech terms are pretty hot because everyone who's doing this is techie. Yeah, yeah. But that's why I found like book. I found like I was doing pocket knife for a while. Like things that the techies aren't really thinking about, those are the ones that are super cheap. So like crypto podcast, that was only 100. Um, but the podcast one. So this one is going to, I, I'm assuming this is like Joe Rogan's. I don't know if, I, don't know if I should click on it. We'll see. Probably a bad idea. The Agoras Nexus podcast. So someone has staked 20,000 to promote this podcast yeah, and well. that's what's driving it. But Hey, like that's the thing is they haven't spent it, right? That's the cool part is they can instantly pull that out and they didn't spend anything to advertise. So yeah, I, like I want to talk about that one last, yeah. last no, I, like that's, I was just thinking today, uh, one of the things I miss about not having you around is you would always find these things before me and then you'd be like, okay, you got to try this thing out. And then, of course, we all know how that ends. I stick with it. You move on to the next thing. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, oh, well, yeah, I gave that up right after the show. I just stopped doing that right after the show. <laughs> and it's funny because even you, we were planning on this episode tonight. And I, that was back when I was self hosting the pre search node. And then I already changed how I did that. And I did it through Flux. And I was like, oh, wait, I should have done that. I should have done that after the show. It's a little bit harder to explain, but um, it'll, it'll make, make a little bit more sense as I talk about my next project, yeah, which is. Flux. Uh, Flux. So pre-search is number one. That was the first thing I did. And then I found Flux. And Flux is distributed computing done through the blockchain. And it's, you know, this is something we're all pretty used to, right? This is why I mentioned folding at home earlier. It is essentially dedicating computer resources to um, a network. And then people can utilize your hardware for different tasks. And so if you go to run, uh, is it run on flux. Yep. Run on flux.io. You can see kind of the, the white paper and what their plan is. So they're really focused on the decentralized web 3.0. That's like, what well, you'll hear a lot from them. And the, this runs in a very similar manner to pre-search. And what I mean by that is this is done by people hosting nodes all across the world. So if you want to dedicate resources, you set up a flux node and again, same concept, you can self-host it if you have the hardware at home, or you could do this through a virtual private server somewhere in the cloud. Um, and they walk you through how to do either. This is way, like pre-search uh, was a little bit more of a pain to set up when you're doing the virtual machine. It's just not as clean and simple. They haven't gotten the installation process very um, well tuned yet. Flux, on the other hand, is extremely 
easy to set up. I've actually had to reset up mine once because I kind of messed up the first time and I needed to move some stuff around on Unraid and I wanted to move where it was stored. So I've done this a few times, set it up, and they have made it extremely easy. So all essentially this requires is that you run an Ubuntu server. So you run Ubuntu, it's 20... It's not the latest version. That's where I messed up the first time. Don't run the latest version of Ubuntu. It's it's one of the LTS versions um, from a while ago. Uh, and mainly that has to do with the um, database application, the MangoDB, that it can't run on the latest version of that. So keep that in mind if you're going to do this. Save yourself the heartache of getting it all installed and having an error out on the DB part of it. Um, so you, you fire up a VM, you run Ubuntu on it, and there's just a, a few commands to get this thing up and running and you're you're off to the races. Now, with the Flux, um, they have a wallet called Zellcore and everything kind of runs through this, this Zellcore wallet. And I actually am a big fan of this wallet. You can run it on a lot of different machines and iOS and everything like that. Um, so the, you run through Zellcore and the, the hardest part about getting one of these up and running is actually just reading through the instructions on how you fund and how you stake your coins for running a flex node uh, because it's, it's kind of a little bit complicated in the Zellcor wallet on, on how to get this all running. But in the end, there are some requirements for running your server and there's different options. So Jim, if you go, go back to that dashboard, the tab to your right and go to economics right below map. So what you'll see here is they give you three different options. So there's Cumulus, Nimbus, and Stratus. Those are the three different levels of VMs, essentially, that you can run. And each one of these costs a different amount of collateral to run, which is the biggest part of this. So um, I this this actually been pretty profitable for me just because of the price of Flux. I got in at um, $0.48 cents per Flux coin, and it costs 1,000 Flux to run collateral. Right, so that was still five hundred dollars of collateral you're putting up to run this. Uh, it has doubled since then in the last month, so it's up to a dollar for that coin. So now it's going to cost you a thousand dollars to run a, just the most basic node you can run. And again, cost is is a relative term, right? Because you can always pull this back out. You're not spending it. You're not burning it. You'll get that back. You'll get those coins back. Whatever. I'm not. You don't know what price you're going to get them back at, but you're going to get those coins back. Um, but when you look at those different levels, the next level up, Jim, is twelve thousand five hundred to, to put in collateral. So that's twelve thousand five hundred dollars right now that you would need to stake to run just the next level up. And when you're looking at the economics down below, it makes a lot of sense why. On the most basic cumulus rewards, which is the one I'm running, I'm nine dollars and twenty two cents is the current um, average amount that you're going to profit. And that's pretty accurate with the exception of if you're self-hosting, um, the very bottom line item there is a VPS cost. They assume it's going to cost um, on the Cumulus side $11. I, if you're running it at home, you don't have that cost, right? That's the cost essentially to pay for your VM in the cloud. If you're self-hosting at home, you don't have that. So for me right now, it's looking more like $20 a month for running this. Um, and then it bumps up from there, which is it's much more profitable if you can run a Nimbus node but again, number one, it's costing you 12,000. So it's costing you 12 times more to stake it. And then the other thing you got to keep in mind are the actual requirements on the virtual machine, which drastically could go up with each of these levels. And so when you're looking at the different requirements, um, if you go to, let's see here, I'm going to try and find the web. Back on the main Flux website, I just want to make sure because they've updated the node requirements. I'm going to pull the latest. Okay, here we go. So for a cumulus, yeah, here you go. You have it on screen there. For a cumulus node, you need at least two cores, four threads, eight gigs of RAM, 220 gigs of storage, preferably on an SSD. Um, and then this uh, MBS, so you need 180 megabytes down, right, for internet. Up doesn't matter. So, oh, sorry, it does. You need 25. So you need 180 down, 25 up. That's a big, the internet speed here is one of the biggest things that's going to be a limiting factor. Most home users are going to have to stick with the lowest tier just because as you start to go up, the upload speed starts to even get beyond what I can do. If you are one of the lucky ones with gigabit symmetrical, then you'll be just fine. But for a lot of us, we're not going to be able to do it. Um, and then that EPS score, that's essentially like, such like, how powerful each core of your processor is. If you're running a modern processor, you are totally fine. I think mine's like in the thousands uh, for my Ryzen and my Unraid. 
So what you can see there is that is what I set up in Unraid. I set up a VM. It has it's using two of my cores, four of my threads. I gave it 250 gigs of one of my drives and, and set it up. And then as you go up, those requirements start to creep up, right? The next level up, you need 32 gigs of RAM. Next one above that, 64 gigs. So you can kind of start to see what they're trying to do is they're really trying to reward their most, their highest end uh, computer systems or virtual machines that they can put apps on, which is, which is right. I mean, that makes a lot of sense. Um, but at least you can get in and start playing. And the way they do their block rewards is kind of interesting. So you'll see 7.5% for Cumulus, 12, 5, and 30%. Each block, you are essentially, so let's say there's 10,000 people running a Cumulus node. That means, and only one person from, from each tier gets rewarded per block. So you're going to have to wait 10,000 blocks until your name comes up and then you get paid. But it's not based off how many apps you're running on yours. It's not based off utilization. It's not based on anything like that. It's strictly just how many of there are, how many there are. And then they, you when your number comes up, you get paid the block reward it's, for that. It's not a lottery kind of it's deal. It's not a lottery. You, you jump no. in line and then and then if somebody drops, you move up a little bit, right? Yeah. Uh, as as well. people yeah. Yep, exactly. They drop off, you move up. Um, but you, you know, if if your machine's getting utilized more or less, it doesn't matter. It's the same amount. And obviously as Nimbus and Stratus, they get a bigger percentage of that block reward. So that's why it's more profitable. And so number one for those two, two top tiers, there's way less people running those tiers and it's more, they get a bigger chunk of the block reward. So that's why those are going to be more profitable. But again, it's, it's just kind of nice because it just sits there and you can actually predict when you're going to get your next little reward. Cause you can count out each block is two minutes and well, how many people are ahead of me in line and, and that's when you'll get paid out. So this is not going to be the most extremely profitable mining. You, you do this because of the ecosystem that they're creating. And so the kind of the, the piece on this that I want to talk about that's kind of cool is if you go back to, well, I don't know if I want to show it. Uh, okay. Yeah. If you, so on my screen, this is, this is not Are my you, node. You sure you want to show it? Yeah, this, this isn't okay. mine. Right. This isn't my node. So if you you essentially every flux node has a dashboard like this and the cool part is what you can see is you can see overall stats from the overall network so in the network right now there's 13,000 nodes i think this part's really cool on the entire flux network there's 90,000 cores that are available 260 terabytes of ram and there's 5.75 petabytes of ssd storage and then 88 te uh, terabytes of hard drive storage, which is kind of cool. And you can kind of see the trends of how people are going on. But what I love about this is if you go down to apps and you go to local apps, when you're on your own node, you can see what type of apps people are running on your VM. And you can't do anything with them, right? But you can see uh, there would be a list here of what everyone's running. Now, the most popular things to run on the Flux node today are um, actual nodes for other projects just like this. For example, pre-search. So when I want to run my pre-search node now, I actually just pay one Flux a month and I host my pre-search node on Flux. So you can actually run a pre-search node here. You can do it with a lot. So if you go to available here, you can see some of the different um, apps that are available. And there's a, there's a really long list somewhere else, but you can run self-hosted websites. You can run little games. There's web games that you can run through here. Um, but there's a massive kind of actually, if you just go to global apps here, you can see all, you can run Minecraft servers. You can run all sorts of, you can run a Valheim server. I know a few of us in the community played Valheim back in the day. Um, you can run all this stuff on Flux and all you, I mean, it's super easy to deploy an app out on the network, which is really cool. And I, just, I don't know, I, I fell in love with this just because of, it's kind of a different take on using the computer resources, how easy it is. Um, I'd like the staking system because the people that, you know, are going to put up a thousand dollars and keep it parked somewhere are actually going to make sure that their server stays online. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it's just a, a good way. I think it's a different, they're, they're fine tuning these sorts of projects and they're getting better and better every time you and I were involved in a few of the earlier ones. And I think each time they do something like this, they just get a little better and they make a little bit more sense. And everyone's focused on the tech and not the price. Like the price of flux going up has been great. People aren't really focused on it. They're like, no, it's just like, let's keep building this out. This could really be cool uh, going forward. Well, the usage of it is always the trick. You know, we, we you and I looked at Filecoin. We did storage. Um, what was the other, what was the other one? Saya. <laughs> Saya. How quickly we forget, right? Yeah. Or at least I forget. Maybe it's too, too many bourbons. 
but the um the the you know they were always like we're gonna compete with amazon and take them down and it's like yeah that 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 doesn't didn't really work out for you they're still by the way they're still saying those things over in those communities right you know and they've got petabytes of of storage available to them people are still doing it um but it's it's that utilization piece of okay well, I like the search side because their ultimate goal is to sell advertising. That's a good thing. Like that's a very real tangible, you know, if you can create a great search engine that people can use and, and people will promote, it's got a shot, right? Yeah. It's got a shot. It's something that, uh, you know, now who, who knows Google could always respond and then just crush it right from, right. They, they, they're, they're pretty big. So, And then this, the flux piece, like, it's always kind of like, well, I mean, is at some point people actually have to start paying for some of this or that system actually has to work in a way where money is coming in. Right. And so that, so that it it, it works that way. So that was always the downfall of all the other ones is they're like, they ideas sounded great on paper, but then it never really materialized. I think the good news is, and as I'm looking at this and I'll spend some more time looking at it there, each time we do this, we make smarter decisions, like yes. less hyper, you know, let's make a million dollars and then bail. That was the first iteration of things, right? Like, Hey, let's get in there, sucker a whole bunch of people and then get out. Right. That's, that's, and then stake came along and that slowed some things down, but it was still a lot of hype that looks like like okay maybe in this version three like okay not so much about price although price is a thing we and then it's expensive to get into this so you're gonna have some skin in the game on the thing yeah and then maybe it'll stay around a little bit longer and maybe it'll turn into something you know it'll, and and, it'll and you nailed it the the part about this is you need in, incoming money not from the existing community Right. And so you need everyone to be like, oh, if I want to run a little app, I'm going to go on Flux and just deploy it real quick because it's super easy. And it is super easy. Right. right? right. But we need the word to get out that, hey, if you want to just run something very simple like this, you know, Amazon is so complicated and the pricing tier getting in and out. I mean, it's 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 hard. This is is dead simple. Right. Like, and especially to deploy a Valheim server like that's just super. That's super cool. Like if, if this even if this could be the go to place for hosting game servers like that. Because nerds all around us, like like I, everyone's always asking, like, hey, well, where do you want to host your Minecraft server? Where are you going to host your Valheim server? It's like, oh, dude, just go to Flux. It's like super simple. You pay them two Flux a month, and you can cancel at any time, and it's distributed, so it's always up. Even if that person turns off their computer, it's, it's you know it's on somewhere else as well. So I, you know, I think that that's what you need. You need that next step. And you know, Justin brings up a good point, right? Because Justin says, man, I should uh, fire up a couple of his old servers because they'd be at the highest level. And put them at work to host. No power, no data, all hardware, and and that's that's a good point. Just keep in mind, if forty thousand dollars per server is going to be staked, right? Because it's forty thousand flux right now to stake the highest, and flux is hovering close to a dollar. Um, I think it's down to like ninety five cents or ninety two cents today. Um, so that's really. <laughs> If you could deploy three of them, now you're making a lot per month, right? And you didn't spend that $40,000, you staked it. So you can fire it up, make $3,000 in three months, and then pull it all back out. Um, and you just hope the the price hasn't crashed. And then that's a kind of a, a big risk at $40,000. Um, but, but that's kind of the, the, the vibe around it. Yeah. Yeah. How did you, like, so can you buy Flux on Coinbase? How did you... How'd you kind of get, how'd you onboard Fiat to, to that? Yeah. Uh, Coin Metro was the one that I used. Um, it's not everywhere yet. I think you can actually maybe do it on Binance now. Uh, I'm not sure. It's not on some of the major ones. Um, so for Flux, I did it through Coin Metro. For pre search, I don't know. There's, there's, you can buy it directly through the website, which honestly might just be the easiest. What I did was I used. Coinbase, but it's it's funny. It's not through Coinbase, it's through Coinbase Wallet. So there's the Coinbase Wallet app where you can kind of exchange some of these types of coins. So I sent Ethereum to my Coinbase Wallet, swapped it for pre-search, and then sent it over. And I, I should have tracked better how much I lost in all of that with conversion and fees and gas and Ethereum to send it over. It was probably quite a bit, um, but it, it did the job. It got it over there. And so, but Flex is a lot easier. You just buy it on Coin Metro. So I sent Ethereum to Coin Metro. 
converted it and sent it over there. Yeah, are they selling either of those on, or are either of those available on Coinbase? I don't believe so. No. Okay. okay. Nope. You'd have to use somewhere else. You get, you get some, you know, with Coinbase, you still get some pretty sweet conversion, free conversions of, yeah. You know, swapping them in between. Um, cool. No, that sounds off to take a look. I was just thinking today, I was kind of like, you know, I kind of need a new project. You know, yeah. I just, I just, I, that's where I, I was. And I just need to get reinvigorated, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. With crypto and kind of focus back on the fun projects. And fl- I, if you're going to do one, I would do Flux. It's just fun. Okay. Um, and, you know, for a lot of us, we like that, those requirements, eight gigs of RAM, 250 gigs of a hard drive, two cores, you can run that as a virtual machine on a lot of NASs nowadays, right? Like my Unraid machine, uh, that was, that was no problem. And just so everyone knows, it doesn't really utilize much of it. And maybe if it got loaded with a bunch of apps, it would, but I'm not seeing much utilization really at all. And yeah. the best part is not a lot of bandwidth, right? Cause that's always been the hard part, Jim, with some of these storage ones yeah. is the bandwidth. All of a sudden your upload or download would be slammed. You'd be going through a bunch of data. So like for you, cause I, you still don't have the Cox unlimited plan. Oh wait, you're on, you're on T-Mobile. No, I'm on T-Mobile. So yeah. I'm good well, go. okay. Yeah. So that would be interesting. Um, because you do have to port forward for Flux. Okay. And I don't know with carrier grade NAT if you're able to do I those types of port forwards. I think they've updated it now so you can, I think. I haven't. I, listen, the T-Mobile thing I put in, I haven't looked at it literally since I put it in. It just it freaking works. works. Yeah. That's great. It just works. And it's solid. And I, I had one day where I had to cancel a work podcast. No, it was this podcast. Um, I had to cancel it cause I got on and my, my upload just wasn't good enough. And we reset everything and tried all that stuff. And it was just, you know, the, 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 uh, the tower is a block away and uh, the tower was struggling for whatever reason. Next day it was fine. You mm-hmm. know, and it was like, well, okay. So that's one. So, um, it, it is, um, well, and Joe says, uh, no, he's on T-Mobile now and it's still, um, still not there for that. I thought there was, I thought there was something I could do. doesn't really matter just to be honest. Yeah. I mean, it's from that perspective. Um, it gets me thinking, Mike. So I have Bob and Ryan coming on, uh, it's September 29th. And I've been thinking about, like, I haven't really bought any new hardware since I bought the M1. So, which has been dynamite. And, um, and I've got some old Windows boxes. I think I'm just going to retire. And I'm thinking like, and I want to do a little VR. So I, I may spend a bunch of time with Bob and Ryan like, okay, guys, here's the deal. We're going to do a show. You're going to put together a, a box. Parts for list. Me. Yeah. I love so it. You're going to put together a box for me, including, and kind of, kind of glad I waited because GPUs are like actually affordable. Yeah, they're affordable now. Right? They finally yeah. came back down. I know. That'd be a good I idea. I think NVIDIA said today they made too many. <laughs> like they're like, we, you know, we're, we think we've got too many in the system, like said by them never. So this may be that time, right, too. I, yeah. I think we're coming up on a time where I think we're going to see some some prices. I mean, yeah, yes, inflation has been a thing. It's been a real thing, especially here in the United States. And I'm, I'm sure in other places as well, but I think, I think we're going to see some things pull back and we're going to see some deals on some, some of these things that were crazy. They made too many of them. They're trying to, they're, they're trying to dump them. So that's coming up, uh, September 29th with Bob and Ryan. We'll spend some time, um, chatting with them as well. And, and Mike also as well, I, I bet you never thought you'd see this day. I'm having uh, Dave from Mac Geek Gab on, and we're going to talk all of my. <laughs> Are you really? Yeah, <laughs> dude. I, 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 I you, uh, you want to show up? It's the twenty. It's the twenty second of September. If you can make it, you could. You could oh, jump on here. Man, I'll just see. Yeah. I like. I would fanboy over Dave. I I love their show. Mac Geek Gab is is fantastic. Yeah, they're they're coming on September twenty second. So they reached out. They reached out to me, and they were like, "Hey, do you want to do a, a promo? Are swap? you doing this promo swap?" And I said, yeah. better yet, why don't you just come on the show? Like, and, and if like, I'd come on, I'd come on your show and, and, and talk about my experience, you know, g- being both windows and Mac in this yeah. kind of thing. We haven't scheduled that yet, but you should, but, um, but. you should get a part of that swap though. That is one of the coolest things. So I've, I listen to them pretty religiously. And so all they do for that swap is they're promoting. So like, 
they would promote home gadget geeks and they're like, and you would give them kind of like what you want them to talk about. You do the same. I have found so many cool podcasts because they, they do a good job of tailoring it to people who listen to the same little genre. And it's, I think it's been pretty effective for them. I mean, they, I just hoping that I can be just a guest on their show for, even if it's just for the, uh, a, a spot, a segment there. Yeah. Dave's going to be on the whole show. So. Yeah. Cause they don't do guests ever though. Yeah. Oh yeah. Well, then maybe I'll, maybe I can, we'll, we'll figure it out. I mean, I, yeah. To but be honest, you having them on would be sweet. Not that worried about it. I'm. I want great guests. And well, at least have them do the guy. spot. Have them do the, yeah. Yeah. the swap thing on theirs. Yeah, yeah. Because you'll 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 pick up some listeners from that. Or, or maybe they can just talk about it. I I really don't want to make anything. I just like, you know, it's like, hey, I want you to come on and uh, and I met with him. I called him the other day. And he's just a super good guy. I have never listened to it, but I was like, yeah, come on. He so I was like, hey, would you just come on my show? He's like, yeah. <laughs> Okay, this would be great. Let's do this thing. So they're one of the few Jim that outdate you. Even you've been doing yeah. podcasting for a long time. He yeah. they have been doing it for a really long yeah. time. Yeah, wild. Yeah, but um, so that, that's cool. That's coming up here. But if you want to join I, me on the 29th, you could do that too. As I build, yeah, let me look. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so Bob Carpenter, you, I can't believe I forgot about this and I'm, I won't get into it now. Cause honestly, Jim, I want to come back on and do like a big segment. Have you guys talked about tail scale yet on the show? No, no, we haven't. It yeah. is game changer mm. game change. Like it is the best upgrade I have made to my whole network ever. It is just brilliant. Um, I can, I, I will, I, the biggest fan of tail scale and we need to spend some time talking about it. I mean, okay. to, to spoil it is essentially, you know how you run a, a VPN to VPN back into your home mm -hmm. yeah. and you need a VPN server, right? right, right. To like host that you're, right. you're potentially tunneling into your network through that. And then you can access yep. all your networks. Yep. Tail scale essentially is you don't, it's not a, it's like a hub and it's like a web instead of a central server. So you're running it on any device you're ever going to need to access. They all get their own IP and you just can see you, you essentially create this network that follows you wherever you go. And it's, it's fantastic. I don't, I now don't even know my local IP addresses anymore. I know them by their tail scale IP because whether I'm away from the home, if I'm doing this wherever, I just use that tail scale IP and it just freaking, it gets through carrier grade NAT like Bob's talking about. So if you wanted to run it, it's the one way that you could probably actually run a VPN now. It gets through carrier grade. It will, if two devices are on the same network, it won't try to go out to the internet. It just knows that, hey, I can just talk to him over the LAN. Or if I yeah. step outside and I'm on cellular, it just knows now to go through the internet. It is awesome. We need to spend some time. I need to come back when you talk about tail scale. It's okay. okay. I, right. I, I got so excited. I, I can't believe I didn't bring that up as part of the things that I. No, you did. did over you the just summer. did bring it up. It's, yeah. Oh, it's. it's, it's well, yeah. and you can see from the chat room, there's a lot of, there's a lot of support for that. Um, you know, um, let's see if I can find it again. Here said, who was that that said you can set it up? Bob said, producer Bob said, tail scale and PF sense took 30 seconds to config. Yes. So most the answer you're going to set up, it's going to take you 30 minutes, an hour, if that. And you got to create keys and you got to work out keys and all this stuff. Literally 10 minutes. I had it up and running on all of my devices. I was working from home one day during one of my Zoom meetings that I wasn't really participating in. I had all my devices connected. <laughs> and really, what this did for me is I was running everything through um, URLs through a reverse proxy. Yeah. So, like, you know, Uyghur.com slash security took me to my security system. Well, that's not very secure because that was public. And I was noticing people were hitting that URL. Now my blue iris box sits on tail scale. Unraid sits on tail scale. Uh, my home assistant VM sits on tail. Like it just, oh, it's freaking awesome. It's so great. Justin says uh, Docker container it. Setup is uh, however long it takes to pull the container. That's for, I'm assuming he's talking about zero tier. So zero tier is like a self-hosted kind of version of tail scale. And you need to self-host essentially the, the device that's exchanging keys because all tail scale is doing from their side is saying you have access to these keys, you have access to these keys. And it's just, it's almost like just saying who has permissions to do what and exchange the keys. Zero tier is kind of a self-hosted way to do that. He said he was talking about tail scale. Oh, Docker. Oh, are you talking like for Unraid? Yeah, you can run the Docker. Um, on Unraid, and that's how like I got it there. So you're yeah. right. Yeah. Uh, listen, I, the, the chat room lit up. They were a little sleepy, 
and then all of a sudden you started. Oh, sorry, guys. It. I should have brought that up instead of boring you with uh, damn, flux and damn, research. No. Um, Alex says, yeah, yeah, he is. Um, I have it set up to allow it to pass to my DNS so I can use the same URLs while I'm away from home. Oh, Alex, I need to talk to you. That's that's literally probably why I didn't bring it up is that's the next. I haven't delved into the DNS side. Uh, I just have everything by IP. I actually use, you know, the self-hosted, we talked about this, self-hosted dashboards. So like Heimdall is one you run in a Docker and all it is, it's just a dashboard of all your self-hosted things. I just changed all the IPs in there and now I just access that dashboard and, and that's what I do. But I need the DNS side. I have not looked into making that all work, but um, yeah, it's freaking awesome. Cool. Well, and, we have- oh, oh. I'll product. mention one more thing just to yeah, yeah. just throw it out there. We'll talk about it more with tail scale. It is super easy to just share one of your devices that's running tail scale with someone else. So we test this at work. So blue Iris is a windows machine, right? I have windows running as a VM on Unraid. It's running tail scale and that's where I can access my security cameras. All I did was my buddy at work runs his tail scale. So he has his own little tail scale account and he runs his, I have mine. I click share. It says send a link. I sent it to Brad. Brad opened it up. It popped up in his tail scale. And now he types in that IP address and he can hit my Blue Iris box. And it's like he's now part of my little network. And then I can remove access. But all he, he didn't get access to my whole network. He's just seeing that one node. He's just seeing Blue Iris. He couldn't hit Unraid. He couldn't hit anything else. Like So collaborating. I mean, I am convinced that I think all businesses are essentially going to switch this as their VPN because their their commercial plan is, is even smarter than just using as a home right? Because user access and all of that, only sharing certain aspects, not a whole network. Uh, it's flipping awesome. So the sharing aspect, it's like, Jim, I could just give you access to Unraid right now. And you'd be like, oh, sweet. Now I can, you know, we could share an Unraid server if we wanted to, or we could have a lot of fun with it. Yeah. Oh, that's eh. cool. Oh, sorry. Yeah. That got me so excited. <laughs> Super good. Oh, this is the, this is the Uyghur that I missed. Yeah. Yeah. The nerdy oh, Uyghur. So nice. Yeah, no, it's good. <laughs> You, you know, you were, you like to, um, I mean, you would be out ahead of things pretty early on stuff and then say, okay, you got to try this. And, uh, and next, and, you know, you're still using that. Oh, I moved on. <laughs> yeah. I already sold like, all that stuff. Weird. I sold all that stuff. <laughs> Mike, anything else? Um, anything else you want to catch us up on or any other, uh, any other tech related items that you've acquired? Um, I, I want to do this more. I'm going to definitely be looking at some dates. It gets tough with, I think T-ball is another Thursday night activity, but I'm going to try and find some. Usually there's times like in between sessions. Like that's why this worked really well, right? Like this mm-hmm. night, we knew, I knew a month yeah. ago that this night was going to work. Yeah. Um, just because, no, because there's not much else, but I'm sure we could talk in nauseam. I do have two other computer hardware failure stories I was going to tell. Won't get into that tonight. Um, long, sto- long story short, keep a Memtest 86 USB around. If you don't oh, have yeah. one of those, make one right now because you're going to need it when you don't think about it and you're going to yeah, want You don't USB think around. of your memory going bad very often. No, uh, when we were setting up for the, all the Chia stuff, Ken was helping me with all the Chia stuff. He, he said, look, memory super important on this. Let's test it all. And so I ran Memtest on those. And sure enough, I had two bad sticks. And they weren't causing, they weren't bad enough to cause Windows or whatever I was running on it. It had to have been Windows to be unstable, but it was enough that, you know, when we, it, this, when we were going to access this memory, it would have choked. So, you know, it's, it's, it's good. It's probably good, you know, when you're setting up a new rig. It's probably one of the burn in tests. It is. Just, yeah. right? And then just to keep that, make that USB and then just put it in a drawer. And just write on with permanent marker. It's my Memtest 86 USB because you just you never know when you're going to have it. And then you, if you only have one Windows machine in your house, good luck creating the USB to test it on when your memory is failing enough that you can't even run. Like that's what I was running into is my computer was so unstable I couldn't even download and create an installer. My work computer is locked down. I can't create them from that. So I had to go dual boot my old iMac into Windows to create this Memtest 86. It was it was a pain. So just create that, have it there. I had a. I had some bad RAM that had gone bad in four months. I came back from yeah. my trip and yeah. everything was just broken. It was weird. It's like I got a power surge, but all my stuff's on surge protectors. But I came back from my vacation and uh, my router, which is an, a Dell R210, was the span. The fans were spinning at full speed. And then my computer was blue screening every 10 seconds. So it was, uh, a, it was a fun way to come back. I'm like, man, what happened here? Someone uh, just came over and dumped water on both of my systems. 
It's yeah, it's just painful. It's and it's the last thing you want to deal with when you come back off vacation. Oh, that's exactly uh, yeah. Well, I knew something was up because someone on my drive back was like, "Hey, is Plex down?" I'm like, shoot, that's that's when I know something like, and it was, and I thought I was thinking Unraid. No, it was the router. So, uh, yeah, bad motherboard. My uh, I've had two family stories. My sister called me. She got a new laptop. She'd backed up. I think I think her old laptop was running Windows 10, but we don't know. And so she did a backup, and then she's trying to get some of those files back, and she's not good at all in it. You know, so it's the same. Well, so I'm, while I'm trying to coach her through this, my brother calls. My younger brother calls. He's like, hey, I'm having a trouble with Ring, and you have a Ring, so you're tech support. Like, it's like awesome. Thank you. Okay. okay. All right. So walking him through through a few things and then he says well, i gotta go all right so then he pings me an hour later he goes well i called rings tech support they fixed it i was like why did you just do that to begin with? so many like it's so weird this and this happens at work all the time um they reach out to the social networks first like hey is anybody having a problem it's like did, did you think to just reach out to the company first you know yeah. they, like I mean, maybe the company actually Oh, you know, and even if they've got great customer support, I think with like Google and Facebook and maybe even Amazon, people have gotten so used to thinking there's no tech support available now. I think you yeah. talk to most people like, oh, yeah, that stuff's not supported. I'm not going to get, you know, I'm not going to get any help. And that's not necessarily true. You know, he made one phone call to ring. They picked up. They said, oh, yeah, it's over here. And he's like, oh. I think my brother tried to tell me that. <laughs> so, uh, and usually yeah. you can at least tweet at him and get a pretty good response. Like Twitter has been a pretty good way to yeah, get yeah, access yeah. to, but most of them support. have great, I mean, or have good support options. Listen, I know I hear, you hear all the bad stories. Nobody has a good story about, you know, that where they get it fixed and they immediately go, Oh, I got to tell people about this on Twitter. Nobody does that. Right. Yeah. Some do, some do. I get it, but most don't. So, um, uh, Mike, uh, we you mentioned I mentioned a few coming up. Jay Franzi is joining us next week, brand new to the network, but a listener and had reached out and heard me talk about looking for some guests. Interesting guy. I reached out to him. And then um, I have this guy called his name is Agent Crew, and he's over at winespies.com. And he we're gonna talk about wine gadgets. Ooh. And he actually listened to the show and he was like, Oh, dude, I got some great things. <laughs> he goes, I love talking about gadgets. This is going to be great. So agent Cruz coming on here on the eighth. Uh, Gavin Campbell is back on the 15th. I mentioned Dave from Mac geek gab will be here on the 22nd. And then Bob and Ryan are showing up on the 29th and Edward Weninger will be back uh, on the 13th of October. I'm sure we'll talk some crypto. The first thing he said to me is, have you sold all those hard drives yet? For Gia? Have you? I, no. You're still no. running. I, yeah. 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 I'm still running it. Yeah. I'm still running. I mean, I haven't won a I haven't won a block in eight months, but I won two in December. So okay. yeah, who knows? Who knows what's I haven't spent a lot of time. I've been I have not spent a lot of time on crypto. I it just is it just hasn't been there for me. So yeah. uh, maybe maybe this will bring it back. So we got a full schedule. Thanks for coming back. Oh, I say all that to say not only to let folks know what's coming up, we have a lot of stuff coming up. Um, but get get some dates to me early so i can get you plugged in so yeah, i can make sure we'll i do. give you priority we'll do. Uh, over over folks coming in edward and i edward was taking a week or two to get back to me on each one and i'd say hey can you make this one and then a week or two later he'd say yeah and I've, i already booked it so i was like okay it's the next and then, you know so we did that two or three times um, yeah and so. i've got hockey coming up too so i want to find a time that's in between one of my hockey sessions so yeah I'll, yeah I'll yeah yeah. yeah let's yeah. get a couple times get them booked farther out in advance the better Cool. Um, Sounds good. I'll let, I'll let folks know. Thanks for coming. Well, thanks for coming out, man. It's always oh, it's it's been so much this. fun. Yeah. Yeah. Good to have you back. Good to see you for this one. And, and fun as always. And uh, it's just good to, just good to hang out together. I need to get out to your place a couple more times here now that the weather's getting better and maybe watch some, uh, watch some football or something football and, uh, and, and get a fire going in the fireplace. That was oh yeah. Cool. Last time I was over there and we had that, we had that going. We are live every Thursday, 8 p.m. Central. And I just read off to you what's coming up here. If you want to catch it live, thank you. A big, uh, big thanks to all of you who give me feedback on this every week. I get some, you know, I get a, a variety of feedback. Um, and, and I always, you know, it's nice to get the feedback. Keith, Keith, 
Keith Lunsford sent me a note on Tuesday. He's like, Hey, I don't think your last show is in the feed. And this was Tuesday. And I thought I had put it in the feed on Saturday and I'd forgot in power press to check the category. That's key. That's the one thing you have to check to get the feed to actually work. And for whatever reason, I hadn't checked it. And so Keith sent me a note. I appreciate that when you guys do that. I know you guys feel like you're bringing bad news or whatever, but obviously I didn't check my own feed that week. <laughs> Those things happen and uh, appreciate your feedback. We are live every Thursday, 8 p.m. Central, 9 Eastern out here at theaverageguy.tv slash live. Maybe we'll do a smidge of pre-show or of a post-show, just hanging out with you. Uh, and uh, thanks for those of you who came out live. Thanks for coming out. With that, we'll say goodbye, everybody.